The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, January 15th, 2016. Hello everyone and welcome to a pre-recorded eBible Fellowship's questions and answers time. This program is designed to interact with you with your questions and comments related to the Bible and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker for this pre-recorded questions and answers time, and say hello to Chris McCann. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Friday Night Question and Answer program tonight. We're going to take a look at the Bible with any questions or comments that anyone may have. I'll just mention that if you're listening on the computer and you would like to call in, we do have a toll-free number. The number is 844-402-3344 in the U.S. only. And once you dial that number, then follow the voice prompts. And this phone number is uh, or, or can be used in addition to the existing conference access. It does not replace it. Okay, um, we have only a short time together, so we're going to begin right away by going to the first person on the phone tonight. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hey, Chris, it's a blessing to have this time. I have a, it's a bit of a silly question, but um, back in April of 2011, we did a mission trip to New York City where we asked all like-minded believers to come out and pass out tracts and hold up signs. And I would say at the most, at the most, 250 people came. And I remember one person who's, who no longer passes out tracts with us said, where's the great multitude? And it was a joke but because we were expecting, you know, a greater number of people. So maybe you could speak a little bit about this. Is it possible that, there are people who come saved, but they just don't have the courage to pass out tracts. And, and if we understand it to be 200 million people, if that's what God is teaching, is it possible that these folks are just going to keep these things in their heart? They're not really going to have the, the spiritual strength, let's say, as some of the believers here in the United States would have, let's say they're in different countries. Could you talk a little bit about this? Sure. Yeah, that that's um, it, it's a good question, and it's come up from time to time. It came up as you mentioned even before May 21, 2011. Um, I remember at the fellowship, uh, the Delco Fellowship, um, making comments that we would or should not expect to see busloads of people pulling up to come to the fellowship because the God has saved a great multitude. Now, we know this not because we've seen them. As you're pointing out, we haven't seen a great multitude. Uh, and, and even if we saw a great number of people who were responding that in itself is not proof of a great multitude because we would never know if everyone um, was saved. Uh, uh, prior to May 21, there were, uh, there were uh, numbers of people that followed the teaching of the Bible that no longer follow that teaching of the Bible. So, and, and those were people that we may have at that time numbered with the great multitude, and yet an important Bible emphasis is on enduring to the end, enduring to the end. So when we look at it, we have to admit, no, I've never seen a great multitude of people, and and yet that's not why we believe it. We believe it because we see it on the pages of the Bible in several places. We see it with the statement of Revelation chapter 7. The Apostle John was shown a vision. I beheld and 
And lo, a great multitude that no man could number that came out of great tribulation. We see it with a great catch of fish in John chapter 21. We see it with the great number that are raised up from dry bones in Ezekiel 37. And they stand upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And in other places of the Bible, we see spiritual teachings that would tie in also. So the Bible does teach that out of the great tribulation, God would save a great multitude. That's a biblical teaching. And, and, and so then we also know from the Bible that um, the biblical calendar has laid out the timeline for the Great Tribulation, that 23-year period that fits so well, perfectly, into the overall calendar that there's no shaking or movement. Everything fits like pieces of a puzzle. And therefore, we know the Great Tribulation took place, and according to the Bible, a great multitude was saved out of great tribulation. That's why we believe a great multitude was saved. Well, again, where are they? And the only thing we can say is that with the electronic medium, with God no longer using churches and congregations, and no longer uh, taking role, uh, when people would join churches, they would Uh, become members and numbers could be added up and and you could know how many people were in this church, this denomination, overall Christianity. But with the end of the church age, role stopped being taken. And again, even when role was taken, you couldn't know who was wheat and who was tares. So that that would, would be ineffective anyway. But with the end of the church age, with the end of calling people to come to a location like a church, then uh, there, there was a great multitude no man could number. You cannot number them because there, there's no possible way of doing it. And so the Bible went out. We know this also during that little season of Great Tribulation also called the latter rain, when God was saving the great multitude, we know God saves through his word, and the Bible went out in an unprecedented way over the electronic medium, in a pure way, in a faithful way, primarily through family radio, and and that ministry, it went out over internet, radio waves, um, short wave, and 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 so forth and so god saved people in india family radio had a couple dozen at least track trips to india and and uh, they were they were broadcasting in many different ways into india it went out into china and and in china um there was the radio taiwan that was broadcasting all the way up to may 21 2011 Uh, 24 hours a day into mainland China, into Vietnam, Cambodia, in the language of the people. And and so the gospel was being broadcast. It it really was saturating the earth, warning the world. This is the timeline. The, The day is coming, May 21, where the door will shut. And in many places, in um, North Korea, there, there is no way for us to know today, even on Facebook. People in North Korea uh, don't come on Facebook. People in China do not come on Facebook hardly because the Chinese block Facebook. And so you're not going to see perhaps millions upon millions of people. And, and many people are in poverty in India. They, they live in dirt villages. You're, you're not going to see them and in Africa, and and so forth. So, in other words, we know from the Bible that God saved the great multitude, uh, and we know 
they're out there in the world and uh, the vast majority of them still alive at this time and god knows who they are and that's all we're ever going to know we're never going to know or see probably great numbers of people now we we may see numbers of people coming in these days we uh, i i was amazed that in uh the time before may 21 there were several family radio facebook groups and a couple of facebook pages the number of visitors or the number of members was relatively small well right now it's continuing also with e-bibles groups and e-bibles pages um the the groups alone number well over 100 110 120,000 people that are part of e-bibles group of course they're not all saved many of them aren't but there are saved people among them and they're continuing to come in but contrast that with before may 21 in family radio groups and you may have had a handful three four five thousand total in all facebook so it it has multiplied and that's just the groups that's not our pages where we have thousands of people that are are still uh, we we um people don't join the page uh, with, with a page it, it's sort of like you you just come visit and you can read things and and facebook tells us how many visitors or people have viewed a page and things like that and there's been um thousands that have done that and and of course that's far cry from millions but we're still here and we're we're still commanded to feed the sheep and that's what we're going to attempt to do the best we're able continue to share truth and people will come in according uh, to god's will and i know uh, i know that the great multitude is there because the bible says they are there and as far as how that will work out i don't know completely but all we're called to do is feed the sheep and and so that's uh what we want to be busy doing but thank you for calling and sharing and let's go to our next caller welcome to our friday night question and answer program please go ahead with your call uh good evening chris how are you tonight I'm doing well, thank you. Please, go ahead. The, yeah, on the answer that you just were giving, uh, the uh, first call, the previous caller, uh, the verse uh, uh, where we read uh, a great multitude which uh, no man can number, I could also uh, go this way. When you were giving that answer, I thought about something, I don't know. Um, the reason that we are not going to see it because no one can number it, and we only found that also in Revelation, we will know only when we are in front of uh, God. I, th- I thought of taking it also that way. We may not see it uh, definitely with a physical eye on earth, but once we are in heaven, that's when we will see, you know, we will recon- not recognize individually, but we will see that great multitude because no man can number it is here on earth. Well, that's the way I, I also could interpret that. That's why we don't see it and people ask, what are they, what are they? And like you said, maybe we're never going to see it except uh, when we'll be in front of God. That's because, also because that's, uh, that verse is also in, in uh, Revelation, you know, in the last books of Revelation. But uh, I don't know if you agree with me on that take, but... Um, uh, I have a question on Genesis 3, uh, verses 8, 11, and 12, please. Genesis 3, verse 8 says, And they heard the voice of Jehovah God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Jehovah, Jehovah God amongst the trees of the garden. And and what were the other verses, 8, 11, I'm and sorry, 12? It was... 
9, 11, and 12. I apologize. With oh, nine, okay. Actually. All right. Uh, verse 9, 12. And Jehovah God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And verse 11, And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Reading these verses, I, uh, I noticed that during this conversation that goes from verse 8 to 13, actually, uh, God seems to be very calm speaking to Adam so as not to terrify him, uh, because it, God passed a, a sudden punishment. Uh, 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 Adam would be really scared, but God seems to be very, very calm. And in fact, there's a dire next change between God and Adam. And But then Adam did not confess, right? He does not say right away, I ate of the tree. He, instead, the way I take verse 11 is Adam implies that it's God's fault for giving him a wife who led him to transgression. In fact, I was checking on the um, J.P. Greens, and, and he says, The woman whom you gave me with, she has given to me of the tree, and I ate. You know, it's just the, the, the play of words on this particular verse in the original that made me think that probably it seems like he, he said, You gave me that woman that made me sin. So passing the fault really first on God who gave him the woman and then on the woman that gave him the fault. I well, think that's yeah. Really, I think. Um, uh, for, first of all, you know, God is always very steady, very even keeled. He, he, he's not emotional in the sense that a man would, would be furious and angry and we lose our temper. Now, God, because of sin, is full of wrath, and, and that is anger, but it's righteous, justified anger, fury that is uh, burning against the sinner. But, of course, God very calmly lays down his law, and he says the wages of sin is death. And it's just a fact. This is the law. God is like a judge that has a criminal come before him, and and the criminal is found guilty, and, and the judge administers the law. The judge pronounces the condemnation on the criminal um, because he is a just judge, and the law demands it. And so God is able to speak kindly and and um, evenly to to rebels to sinners as all men are and 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 so we see that here as he approaches Adam and he asks him where art thou and who told thee he's asking him questions who told thee thou was naked hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat. And, and so the Lord is pointing out the law that he established concerning the tree, and he's asking, have you broken the law? Have you transgressed? Have you committed sin? And Adam, when he fell into sin, became dead in sin and all that accompanies death in sin, that separation between man and God, was already in view. Already we can see that Adam it is seeking to justify his actions. And that's what people tend to do. We're, we're all full of reasons why we do things, uh, as we were Discussing in the Bible study with marriage and divorce, people have all kinds of reasons why they need a divorce. And, and we, we justify, uh, some people do, why they have to steal because they need money. And why I do this and why I do that. And, and it's the nature of man to 
attempt to justify himself before God, and right away, that's what Adam is doing. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. You see, I wouldn't have this problem if if you did not give me the woman. But you gave me the woman, God. You're the one who brought her into my life. And I naturally trusted her because you gave me the woman. And I thought, well, how could anything go wrong after you gave me the woman? And it's taking the focus off of himself. And Eve does the same thing when she then speaks of the serpent, that the serpent beguiled her. It's the nature of people. We don't want to just admit our guilt, and and there is no justification. And, and, and that's why Psalm 51 is such a wonderful psalm that shows us when someone's broken before God, when someone has been humbled uh, by the Spirit of God and, and sees their sin, and they're no longer attempting to justify themselves, but they, they come to God broken in heart. As it says here in Psalm 51, in verse 1, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. There is a heart that is no longer seeking self-justification or, or seeking to blame somebody else. Uh, you know, David could have come up with excuses too. And he could have said, well, the pressures of the kingdom were, were too much. Uh, that's why I was on the roof. And, and the woman appeared and she should not have been Um, bathing openly on the roof and and he could have attempted to explain and and alibi and justify his actions but no no uh, I acknowledge my transgressions against thee have I sinned and done this evil that thou God might be justified when he speaks and clear when he judges that's the attitude of the child of God, we admit it. We admit it. We confess. I'm a sinner. Like like the publican, we beat our chests. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Not like the, the Pharisee in that same account in Luke 18. It, it says, after the publican beats his chest, In verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. God resists the proud. And and unfortunately, we're seeing with Adam already some pride. Some pride is coming in. The woman thou gavest, he's shifting the blame. But thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to our next caller. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Um, Genesis 6, 3 and Genesis 7, 4. Genesis 6, verse 3. And Jehovah said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. In Genesis 7, verse 4, For yet seven days, and it will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Every living substance that I have made 
will I destroy from off the face of the earth. It's not, neither one of these uh, uh, references to time would be referred to as great tribulation. The, the seven days we know would culminate in what uh, is spiritually May 21, 2011, and the chapter 6 verse would either be um, that period of time or, or the five months until the ark rests. Do we know what either of these time references mean spiritually? Well, um, the uh, seven days we we know relates to one day as as a thousand years, and and so it points to the seven thousand years from the flood until God shut the door seven thousand years later on May twenty one, twenty eleven. Now the the 120 years reference is the time leading up to 4990, 120 years prior, where God gave uh, Noah advance warning so he could begin construction of the ark. And in the Bible, um, 12, as 120 is 10 times 12, 12 goes together with 13. When we look at 12 apostles, but there were actually 13. Or 12 tribes of Israel, but there were actually 13. And there should have been 12,000 years of history and then the end, but there was actually 13,000 because the Old Testament was 11,000 years up until the coming of Christ. And then, when Christ came, Satan was bound, the Bible tells us, for a thousand years. We put them together, and that totals 12. But the length of Satan's actual binding was 1,955 years, the whole period of the church age, almost 2,000 years, which brings the, the total... Um, timeline for Earth to 13,000 years. So again, the world should last 12,000, but last 13,000. And 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 here with this statement, as it says there, um, God will not always strive with man. He also is flesh. His day shall be 120 years. It, it seems to be like a final statement of how long man will continue. And it was a literal 120 years until God did destroy all flesh on the face of the earth in the days of Noah. But again, that would point to the end of time, 12,000 or 13,000, when God brings the final judgment as he did 7,000 years from the flood, going one day as 1,000 years on uh, May 21, 2011. It doesn't have to be 13,023? Well, no, because... Oh, it's in the 13,000. Uh, for instance, the number of times around Jericho. Um, first, they went around once a day for six days. And then, for some reason, on the seventh day, they went around seven times. And, and so God split up, really. He made a distinction in the way they went around the city on that seventh day. And you wonder why. Why Why would he do it that way? Why not have him walk around one more time on the seventh day? But then when we look at it, after the seven times around, the wall of Jericho came tumbling down. And we can see how God has broken up the timeline for the world because... From creation to the flood was 6,023 years exactly to 4,990. And so six times around Jericho identifies with that first earth. And then on that seventh day, they go around seven times because from the flood, one day is as a thousand years. You go 7,000 years and you come to judgment day which we have already and now we're in a period after 
Judgment Day from May 21, 2011. We don't know at this point how long it would last, but let's let's just suppose that uh, Judgment Day goes from, say, 2011 until 2033. And if you start counting in 2011, if that's year one, then 2033 would be year 23. And, and so you could actually see an even break where the first Earth went 6,023 years, then 7,000 years after that, plus 23 inclusively, and perhaps then the world ends. But, you know, God is just giving capsules or, or he's giving short little directions or or spiritual bits of information in a spiritual picture you know how are you going to illustrate with 13 times around jericho um tribulation periods of 23 years or 2300 days or anything like that how how would you do that you know they're they're walking around the city six times what do they do they stop and and then God says, all right, now for the next 23 minutes you walk around, it, you couldn't do it. And, and so God hits the main numbers, the, the key numbers for the time of the end. And 1988 was Earth's 13,000th year, and that signaled the end of the world. And we've been living in the end of the world since that time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And let's take our last caller tonight. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. I don't know if you remember my question from Sunday. It was regarding whether uh, anybody in the Old Testament could know what the spiritual meaning of the sun was. But would Psalm 2-7 help anyone back then, do you think? Psalm 2 and... Verse 7 says, I will declare the decree, Jehovah has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Well, yeah, I, I think they, they knew um, that the Messiah would be the son of David. They knew that. And here, Jehovah has said unto me, Thou art my son. It, uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, how much they could have known about the Son of God. They should have known, or a child of God could have known, and, and probably did, actually, that the Messiah would be God. The Messiah had to be God. With Isaiah's verses concerning the virgin conceiving, and a son is born whose name is Almighty God, and, and some of the other statements in the Old Testament concerning the Messiah who is to come, the Anointed One, they should have realized, the, the true believers should have realized that we're looking for God, uh, we're looking for God to come in the flesh. Yeah, and, and the, the phrase, this, this day have I begotten the, I don't know if they would have known that was pointing to the, before the foundation of the world and the resurrection, as, as opposed to physical birth. Yeah, um, I, I don't think they would have known teaching that God kept hidden as a mystery. Uh, you know, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians, when, when God uh, opened up the information concerning the Gentiles being fellow heirs with the Jews. And, and that's uh, actually, um, in many places in the Old Testament, pretty much in plain sight. And and yet yeah. the Apostle Paul says, a mystery was revealed to me. And when we, we see uh, Peter's reaction uh, to the vision of the unclean animals being let down on the sheet and God telling him to rise and, and eat, and Peter saying, not so, he's never eaten anything unclean, and it, it took a great deal of pressing on God's part, a, a great deal of showing them, look, this is what it means. 
in Isaiah with all those statements and other places concerning the nations or the Gentiles, they are fellow heirs. And, and so God had to show Peter three times. He had to reveal the mystery to Paul. They still had to have a council about it. And that's with God specifically telling them that this is what it means. And so I don't think we would have any expectation that Old Testament Jews, even true believers, would have known the meaning how the Son became to be the Son of God through dying at the foundation of the world and rising from the dead when God kept that information hidden and concealed even from the New Testament believers until the time of the end. There, there was nobody who knew that Christ made payment for sin at the foundation of the world before just a, a few years ago when, when God opened up Mr. Camping's eyes. I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you could search um, the church writings and, and uh, over the 2,000 years of the church age, and you wouldn't find anything about Christ making payment and, and dying for sins, actually, you would find references in principle, but not that he actually did it, and and especially um, going to the cross was a tableau. You would not find anything about that. God kept that reserved for the time of the end, and, and uh, I, I'm thankful that God has opened up this information because... Yeah several times now in in studying Genesis or studying other parts of the Bible it's been very helpful in in showing what's in view with certain verses uh, having that information really has been an aid to uh, to further understanding the word of God but thank you for calling and thank sharing you. and I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight we have come to the end of our time please join us again this coming sunday afternoon lord willing during our online fellowship at about 12 30 we have a bible study and then about 1 15 or 1 30 we have a question and answer program a live question and answer and you're invited to join us then but for now I'll say good night and may the lord's perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and certain weeknights following the Monday through Friday studies. Check eBibleFellowship.com for the current schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.